Hello, welcome. My name is Chris Costello. I'm part of the American Indian Initiative here at Colonial Williamsburg. And I'm here with some of our various trades. Uh, Ken from the blacksmith shop, Bobby from the silversmith shop, and Mark from the tailor shop to discuss Indian trade. Indian trade is happening all throughout the 18th century. Uh, sometimes these discussions before uh, the delivery of the goods are had in places like the governor's mansion where they set up um, the terms of the agreements and these formalities are had there. And sometimes they're taking place out in these native nations. And these formalities are things like uh, they're going to have introductions, they're going to have um, small talk, how did you make it through the winter, how is your family faring, and then they're going to share a meal, often prepared by the head peoples of the tribe. And so once they share that meal, they will also have long-winded talks about how great it is to see one another, and then they will finalize the deal by smoking tobacco. Now sometimes it's smoked out of uh, a native made pipe, or it's smoked out of something like a tomahawk pipe made by a blacksmith. Let's see some of the examples of those type of things made in the blacksmith shop. So before each one of our videos, um, you know, from a trade shop, uh, we'd like to have like a little 30 second to a minute long, minute long at most, a uh, little segment where we show clips from a little trade sequence that we did and a voiceover uh, can give additional information about the subject we're going to talk about um, or related subjects. So trade in general uh, and then hopefully maybe uh, an extra little bit that relates specifically to the objects that are going to be featured in the Uh, iron and steel are materials that offer strength and durability and hardness that were not found in softer metals like uh, mm -hmm. copper or silver and certainly not in shell. Um, and so the value system uh, is with the value of the tools rather than a currency. The tools become the currency of trade. Yeah, and they really make uh, life much easier and things more convenient for Native folks. These ready-made tools are providing an opportunity to uh, increase production with things like wood cutting and gathering uh, with those axes and tools and guns as well with uh, hunting. You can teach someone how to use a gun pretty quickly where it takes a long time to not only produce a bow but using that in, those, uh, in that hunting. You have to learn a lot of skills. And uh, things that are made in the blacksmiths are a good example like the uh, armbands that are made out of tin but they're also made out of silver. Let's take a look at some of those silver armbands and silver products made at the silversmiths. It's not only furs and hides that native folks are trading to the traders that are coming into town or in these uh, treaty talks and these agreements. They're also trading information, so cartography and maps and information that they have of locations of towns and uh, hunting grounds. And what they're getting in return are some of these silver items that you see in the video, gorgets and armbands. Let's take a look at some of these uh, silver items that are being traded to the native community. Here in the silversmith shop today, uh, Megan is working on laying out a design on an item of trade silver. Uh, my name is Bobby. I've been working on some trade silver as well. And trade silver is something that was traded with native people in the fur trade. Many of these shapes that are traded in the fur trade are very European designs that another meaning is being put to them kissing otters, beavers, turtles, other designs. This is very expensive material. Sterling silver 
It's what your money was made from. So it's a show of wealth in the native culture, a show of wealth in the European culture. And so a person can walk into a store with a number of these brooches or pins on and uh, take it off, have it weighed, and then they can buy what they want with the weight of that piece. We don't have any reference to silversmiths in Williamsburg making a lot of their income on trade silver production, but places like Philadelphia, New York, up in Albany, uh, these are large areas where uh, many, many trade silver pieces were made. Joseph Richardson in Philadelphia, uh, in one of his ledgers, he has an order from one of the large trading companies for tens of hundreds of pieces of trade silver. So uh, there is a lot of money being made by silversmiths in the, uh, making these items. A lot of the trade silver was cut with a jeweler's saw. Could you pick up the jeweler's saw? Thank you. Uh, but we also have a lot of reference to them being punched out. Something like a piece like this with the shapes punched out and the rest of it cut with the saw. We also have reference to trade silver being made in England, in France, and sent over here for part of uh, trading in the fur trade. So there's a lot of variety of the trade silver that was traded. Some of the small pieces to be worn as pendant. There were also ear bobs nose bobs, uh, brooches. You might have, and we've seen portraits of, of native people with maybe 20 brooches adding as adornment along a piece. And so it's decoration, but it's also a show of wealth. Now, true shows of wealth, you might have somebody with something like this around their neck. That is a lot of silver. That is uh, uh, you know, certainly showing off their wealth in the tribal community. Welcome back. So you saw various um, examples of the silver work being done, the silversmiths in uh, lieu of the trade with um, native folks. Items like the gorget, of which I'm wearing here, and Bobby has some great examples of other ones. Yeah, there's a lot of variety in the gorgets and sizes and decorative aspects as well. Uh, here's a very large one that doesn't happen to be engraved, um, smaller ones. You'll also see well, the quality of the gorget, some of them are rolled with wire to make them very sturdy. This one is not, but it's bent right there to be nice and sturdy. And a lot of silversmiths are, colonial silversmiths are making plenty of these pieces, but they're making even more items like brooches uh, to uh, put on fabric. Uh, for every, uh, there are in, invoices and ledgers that survive from silversmith uh, shops that mm -hmm. uh, something like 300 dozen ring brooches compared to maybe uh, two dozen um, gorgets might be uh, in, traded in the fur trade. So uh, very popular pieces, but the ring brooches, there's thousands traded in, in over the years in the fur trade. Yeah, and uh, there's a various items being made out of a lot of different materials. Um, again, with the silver work, there's a lot of examples of uh, adornments for our, cost or our outfits and things that we wear here um, for our programming that you'll get to see great examples of. We do have some examples of, of as well of some of our blacksmith work here, um, like the gun we have and some uh, pipe tomahawks. Yeah, one of the things I would highlight would be uh, a, a pipe tomahawk like this. Um, and, and the interesting element of the, the pipe tomahawk is that it's a blend of cultures. As you have the, this uh, uh, commerce between cultures, the makers then begin to try to uh, create things that are desirable to the consumer. And when you look at this object, it's a, a more or less a traditional uh, European axe, belt axe, a light uh, duty axe, but it also has attached to it this uh, tobacco smoking bowl. So it's, it's building on that native tradition of smoking tobacco, but the style actually uh, comes from um, na uh, native styles that were made in stone or wood. Um, 
So the form really appeals to the customer in this case. Yeah, these are great examples of some of the ready-made um, tools and items that are coming into our communities. Um, some of those items are coming in forms of textiles as well. So you have things like wool that's coming in. Uh, let's take a look at some examples of the textiles in the Indian trade. Fashion has changed uh, greatly since uh, first contact and the 18th century. So you're going to see a lot of different textiles and shirts and materials coming in in the native trade. Now we have a few examples of these uh, materials. So let's take a look at what the tailors have at their shop. I'm Mark Hutter, master tailor here in the Durfee shop in the Department of Historic Trades and, and Skills. Cloth was, uh, without a doubt, the single largest import to the colonies uh, in the 18th century, coming from all over the world, but through England and on English ships. The incredible diversity of textiles that were available to consumers in the urban centers of the, the coast also filtered into the backcountry trade to serve distant European settlements and native markets uh, also. The native consumer by the, the early 18th century had enough defined fashion within Native American communities that they, they had considerable influence on the types of products that were being brought into the back country. And with the uh, conclusion trade. of the tobacco Specific smoking, wolves, they will now of trade the items and uh, linens. from the trader. Certain qualities and of these are going to were demanded the native folks, by and they the, will be inspecting the them for that uh, expected quality. Probably the most um, items like common the axes and the hose in the back country and trade for both. European and, and Native with the American conclusion. consumers is a wool from England called Stroud. Here are a couple of examples uh, of it. Stroud takes its name from a river in Gloucestershire um, in which the fabrics were dyed, or at least the waters from the river were used to dye these deep bright reds and dark blues. What really is indicative of Stroud to the 18th century uh, consumer is any of a variety of salvages, these patterns that are left on the edge of the cloth uh, when being dyed. And this became part of the fashion specifically for the Native American consumer. Different types of salvages were preferred in different seasons, a changing fashion. And one season it might be stars and the next worms, which are created in the different um, patterns by which the fabric is stitched onto the rod when it is used to be dipped into the, the cloth. So it's, it's part of the production uh, of the, the cloth, but it becomes part of the fashion for the, the native consumer. In 1714, backcountry merchant James Logan um, writes a very, a very specific order to his London supplier. Um, that his Native American customers do not want the same salvage that they had had the year before, that this year they want two black stripes uh, in it. And he also comments that they judge these things for their fashion and their fineness, the quality uh, of the cloth. Well, welcome back. So you saw some great examples of some of the textiles, materials that are uh, coming out to these uh, Indian folks in the Indian trade, things like uh, wool and cotton, linen. But some of these are coming as ready-made shirts, shirts like the one I'm wearing today. And personally, some of my favorite shirts are the ones with the prints on them, like the one that Mark has here. By far the majority of the shirts that are available in the, the backcountry and native trade are plain white linen, like the one that you're, you're wearing. And the bulk of them are being produced in London warehouses, um, shipped here en masse. The same shirts were available to any consumer here in, um, in the East Coast towns and, and communities. Um, and while thousands upon thousands of plain white shirts were uh, filtered into the backcountry market, the adaptive fashion of Native American consumers created the demand for patterned shirts, like you said. So here's a good example 
of an inexpensive printed cotton, the sort that probably was made in Manchester in the northwest of, of England, um, made into a shirt specifically for the Native American consumer. Not only is it different in the fabric, um, but the length of the shirt. Uh, Native men seem to prefer to wear shirts shorter than European men do. And they often leave off the, um, the buttons at the wristband of the shirt and tie, uh, just as you've done uh, today. I think this is a great example of how European goods are first adopted into Native markets and then adapted specifically for uh, Native markets. To a European wearer, a shirt is specifically an undergarment. Um, as you can see on myself, it's barely seen at the wristband and, and at the collar. And therefore, it's unworthy of any sort of, of adornment. It's kept plain for serviceable nature and easy laundering. But to the native wearer, the shirt becomes an outer garment. And very often, the, uh, a lot of adornment is, is placed on it. The shoulders are sometimes painted with vermilion, that bright red um, uh, mineral. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, silver brooches uh, adorn the shirts. Um, sometimes ribbon work can be found, especially by the end of the 18th century, mm -hmm. as there is changing fashion um, and changing detail throughout the, uh, the period at which we look. Yeah, these are truly a great example of my favorite style um, of shirt. Might be uh, even considered gaudy in this modern day as well, but uh, yeah, and, truly. <laughs> and in the 18th century. Gaudy is the word often used to describe um, particularly patterned shirts in the, in the Native American trade. Although in the 18th century, gaudy doesn't have the pejorative sense uh, that some might apply to it today. Yeah. And uh, before we move on to questions, I want to um, say that we're going to show a blacksmith video. We did have a little bit of a technical difficulty, but we're going to show some great examples of Ken talking about some things being made in the blacksmith shop. And with the conclusion of the tobacco smoking, they will now trade the items um, from the trader, and these are going to the native folks, and they will be inspecting them for that expected quality. Um, items like the axes and the hose, and these are coming from uh, blacksmiths. And so let's see um, these items from a blacksmith's perspective. I'm Ken Schwartz, blacksmith here uh, in the Anderson Blacksmith Shop. So what kinds of uh, iron and steel objects are we talking about? I've got examples here, um, tools like axes, uh, sharp edge tools that take advantage of the hardness of steel. Um, you know, that's much harder than any material that uh, the Native Americans have. You also see variations that include something like a hammer. So you're combining two tools, the sharp edge tool and then a hammer for driving or chipping. Probably the more sophisticated forms you're finding uh, are what are known as pipe tomahawks. So these are made so that you have the sharp edge, but you also have a tobacco bowl here and you can put tobacco in it, it's smoked through the handle. And you'll often, uh, in, in the, the few instances we've got of Native American portraiture, you'll often see that the, the Native American holds that uh, in the portrait as a symbol of his uh, status within the community. There were also uh, various knives that were traded, um, knives for working, um, you know, for hunting, for gutting, for skinning. They're used in fighting. So other sharp edge tools, including tools that you'd use for woodworking. So draw knives also um, are a trade item. And there's a whole style of gun that develops for trade with Native Americans. This is a pretty good example. They're very lightweight shotguns, sort of simple in their hardware design, simple in their ornament. You see in this one, it's got a painted ornament instead of a carved ornament. Uh, but these become valuable trade goods. Um, likewise, fire steels, those are distributed uh, um, and exchanged for material goods. They're objects that are made in tin and sometimes in brass that show up as trade goods. Probably the most noted would be cooking kettles. So instead of having to use clay pots, these metal kettles 
especially if they're stackable like this, or lightweight and durable, uh, and they become important. And fashion accessories like armbands. So these pierced armbands are sort of a cheaper version of a silver armband. These are all common goods that are, are being mass produced by British industry. Uh, some are made here in North America, but um, metalware like that becomes important currency with the Native American population. So now that you've seen some uh, videos and some examples of things like ironwork and uh, silversmith work and textiles from the tailor shop, you might be wondering what are Native folks trading uh, to the colonies in return for some of these goods. You're going to see them trading things like uh, deer hides, wood bison hides, elk hides, um, various um, different types of furs, uh, even beaver. So uh, beaver is a pretty high commodity in the time because everyone's hats are made out of beaver. Um, and so I would like to open up the floor for some questions. Um, yeah, thanks all of you for joining us and we apologize to everyone for technical difficulties, but I think we're all here now. You mentioned sending furs uh, to colonists. Um, what else were, were American Indians trading uh, in addition to furs and hides? So they're also trading um, access to waterways, territory. Um, even things like timber, right? So the colonists, they want to come and timber some of those lands. So they'll be bargaining those um, territories full of timber in exchange for some of these ready-made goods. These are very uh, large transactions that are happening. So as we see things like furs going um, to colonists and then maybe back to Europe, maybe Mark or any of you speak about what, what happens next? Why are they surprised in addition to hats? Um. Remarkably, the, the primary use of the, the skins and furs that are coming out of North America via the Native American trade are to, to feed European and Euro-American fashion. Um, the deer skins, um, which are the primary product of the southern trade, and beaver skins, the primary product of the northern uh, trade, which Williamsburg sits uniquely right between the two. We're on the very northern end of the southern trade and the very southern end of the northern trade. But both of those products are creating objects of European fashion. Deerskins for such things as gloves for both men and, and women. Um, leather breeches like the, uh, like the ones that Ken is wearing right now. Um, Many of these uh, skins are sent to England green or raw and processed uh, there, made into products and sent back to the American market. Beaver, the primary fur from which hats uh, is made, um, although not the, the only fur, we also see rabbit or coney, um, uh, otter, um, and while not from North America, curiously camels down as well. But from North America, beaver is the, the primary fur in hats. Is sent again to England and shipped up to the Midlands uh, where the processing begins. In some instances, garments of European fashion are made from those furs and sent out for use. And the, the used garments are then purchased back. Um, and there is some discussion that the, the oils that accumulate in the fur during use make, then make better hats. But the, the uh, pelt is stripped of its fur. It's not the long glossy hair of the beaver pelt that's used, it's the soft downy under hair called the plu, uh, which is then felted, made into a, a compacted material and essentially molded into the, the hat. There's very little of this work being done here in North America. It's, it feeds the empire by purchasing the furs from the Native American market, shipping them across the ocean to be processed in, in England, and then shipping the product back again. That large circular trade keeps many more people employed and in the end, a higher profit, although a more consistent product in greater quantity 
less expensively for the final consumer than trying to establish that trade in, in producing the hats here. Mm -hmm. So Mark had mentioned some differences between things going out north and south. Were, were there any, and granted we're talking about many different cultural groups, but were there trends and, you know, northern Indians were looking for certain things that southern ones weren't and, and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. You're seeing uh, very specifically people choosing different colors. So you see a lot of blue and red being chosen by some communities, or even uh, other communities choosing a much more wide variety of colors. So you might see purples and blacks and greens being chosen by those communities. So uh, fashion is very different from one nation to another and what they prefer. Even with some of the uh, silver designs and things that you might see, uh, maybe Bobby can uh, elaborate further on some of the silver that's going out. Yeah, I didn't see in my research much difference from northern to southern. There was some, uh, but um, just huge numbers all the way from you know Canada down to Alabama of, of okay. the trade. But really, these ring brooches, the most common uh, uh, item you're going to see anywhere. I think something that you could probably all speak to from, from different angles is this question uh, from Doug, who mentions, aside from trading items and rights for things such as lumber, is there any knowledge of regular sharing of trades knowledge? Did Native Americans teach Europeans uh, any you know, craft knowledge? Were there any Native Americans brought on as apprentices in Williamsburg, or were craftspeople going out into the community? There's a little bit of sharing in the iron and steel trades uh, because iron and steel become so critical to uh, you know, comfort and security within both cultures. Um, the Native Americans are relying on, um, you know, on settlers uh, in communities like Williamsburg to supply goods or to supply services like repair and maintenance, but they also see the value in having that knowledge themselves and they begin to pick up some of those uh, uh, skills from um, their European counterparts here. Uh, so there's a little bit of that, but um, they're still relying, well, as do most of the consumers here in Virginia, uh, they're still relying on English industry for the bulk of the production. I think a lot of the skills that are picked up within the communities are gonna be those skills of being able to maintain and repair mm -hmm. objects. Yeah, and you see some uh, examples of the exchange of knowledge as well. Um, things like cartography and maps that are being exchanged. There's a very good map made in 1721 by the Catawba that gets um, given to the governor of South Carolina. And the English actually contribute to some of the uh, details of the map. In later time, they add, you know, which towns... Uh, are on the map, which tribes are on the map, and these maps are um, provided to the English, which they take and put into their own maps. The two different types of cartography are, uh, are vastly different. The native maps that they have are very similar to um, a subway map, where it's showing um, direction and relationship of where those places are, and not so much um, to scale size. So it shows the connection between some of those tribes and um, their communities that they're trading with. Well, on the subject of education, there was also an Indian school uh, here in Williamsburg, uh, what we call Brafferton Hall up at the College of William and Mary. And I think, uh, I think as a study of that would, would tell you that it's, it's not really a technical transfer, but this transfer of knowledge and I think the two different cultures uh, had sort of different uh, views of what was to be learned. The English were trying to, of course, convert native cultures into European ways of uh, existence. But I think uh, from what I've seen, Native American cultures took that information and then began to use their understanding of English culture uh, as a lever in some of these trade negotiations that we're talking about. So on the subject of education, that was happening right here in Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. I think to our current knowledge, we're not aware of any native individuals who were apprenticed to trades yeah. um, here within Williamsburg. Um, but 
information is always coming to, to light. Uh, in terms of textile skills, as Ken said with metals, a lot of the skill that's being learned by Native communities is um, maintenance and, and repair. Although, as I commented, there is some evidence for shirts being made in Native communities or in military installations like Fort Pitt um, in the back country where Native women were, uh, were employed to make shirts um, for, the, for the, the merchants and traders uh, that were there. I also think uh, another interesting aspect of that, uh, that exchange, as Mark says, we don't really have apprenticeship indentures or formal apprenticeship of natives into workshops here. But it seems if, if you read some of the early journals, for certain individuals, there was a great fascination with the native way of life and with native culture. And you do see blacksmiths and gunsmiths that actually go out and live in uh, Indian communities. Uh, and I think that's where the exchange of knowledge comes about. Uh, you know, they're, they're bringing that knowledge into the community and sharing it with the residents. The residents mm -hmm. are picking that up for their own benefit. We've touched on some of these things, but are there some other good examples of how American Indians might completely either physically alter an object or simply reinterpret it, its use and sort of weave it into their, their culture? Yeah, absolutely. There's a great example in uh, our collection here at Colonial Williamsburg of a pair of armbands being repurposed where they um, take one armband, um, whether they lost the other one or it become uh, damaged and unrepairable, we do not know, but they take the remaining armband and cut it into two separate um, wristbands. And so um, you can tell it's been altered by uh, somebody. So one side has an engraving and the other does not, and they both match up very well. So they are repurposing some of these items um, that they're getting in trade. And you, you do see that also with um, brass kettles, for example, uh, you know, sheet brass kettles. If uh, for some reason, you know, they get a hole in them and that hole can't be repaired readily, the material still is valuable enough that it's cut up and repurposed into other things. Um, so you'll see armbands or uh, you know sharp edge or sharp pointed things made from those uh, scraps. And I think also the meanings of items get repurposed too. Uh, in uh, before Europeans set foot on the continent, there in a lot of native cultures crosses, and of course then Europeans come and are trying to convert natives, but you know, some tribes do, I think more up in Canada, but, um, but then you have you know, other uh, cross designs that um, you know, somebody in, you know, uh, and to each individual uh, tribal community and each individual person, they're going to have different meanings for that person, but it's that European design that's being uh, you know, repurposed into you know, whatever their own belief system is. Yeah, and some of them um, nose bobs and earrings that she has there, um, they, their original purpose may have been to be put into an ear as an earring, where you might actually see them adorning something like a, a bandana or, or another piece of clothing where it's um, actually kind of dangling down as an adornment for um, clothing versus actually being worn in its uh, original intended purpose. But what about influence going the other direction? Certainly when it comes to fashion, at least, um, Anglo-American colonists were open to Chinese and French design influences as, as well as others. Uh, was there a, an influence in, in design coming from um, American Indian uh, patterns and so forth? Yeah, there definitely was uh, some influence on what we're wearing, mainly the textiles themselves, right? It, it comes in, and so you might see things like my leggings, which are made of wool, but they're still in the fashion of which we would uh, traditionally wear them. So you see a little bit of um, maybe some resistance to switching over to full breeches or pants, right? Um, but yeah, they definitely have a large influence on what we're wearing um, and so you'll see things like the shirt um, and these, the ribbons I'm wearing. So there's some influence back and forth in both directions. As you said, the leggings that you're wearing are made in the same manner that they would have been had they been made in leather mm -hmm. centuries prior 
to, uh, to European contact. And so there's, there's not much of an adaptation in the form of the garment, but there is in the material from which it's made, um, and perhaps in the sewing and uh, techniques and the uh, adornment. Um, you mentioned breeches not being particularly popular uh, amongst native men. And while there are occasional reference to native men wearing breeches, the general opinion of native men seems to have been that breeches were considered effeminate. Um, the, the leg, particularly the, the bare upper leg, was considered uh, an expression of masculinity in most Native American, particularly Eastern woodland uh, cultures. And so, um, and while Native women uh, often covered the, the legs in a wrap and a skirt, so that for Native men, uh, European men covering the legs was thought of as unusual, uh, to, to say the, the least. I think the question was also asking whether or not there is definable or identifiable Native American influence on American and perhaps on European uh, fashion. Um, there, there are small elements that can be tracked um, certain types of, of adornment. Unfortunately, the most common uh, sort of imitation of Native American fashion in Europe at this time would be in masquerade uh, dress. Mm -hmm. And dressing as a, um, in period parlance, a, a savage, um, a Native American in, individual for fancy dress was a fairly popular affectation um, in the, the, the gathering places of, of England. It doesn't seem to have been, well first, masquerade here in North America is very, very uncommon. Um, so we don't have that same sort of influence uh, here. But one notable um, adaptation of pseudo-Native American fashion is the use of a hunting shirt, a fringed smock uh, that develops in the backcountry of Virginia um, and lower Pennsylvania after the French and Indian War and becomes one of the, the highly identifiable garments, uniforms of the, the early revolution and is sometimes referred to as an Indian walking dress. But its, its relationship is vague. Um, it's really just the, the fringe adornment that perhaps winks towards Native American fashions. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Aaron wondering where initially the silver would come from, but I wonder if we could expand on that and for different types of, of textiles and with iron and with silver, give us a, a sense of the journey from the most raw material to something that Chris is wearing or using or, or you know, well, how, what's the whole sort of yes. chain? Well, there? just in, in, you know, in a, a colonial shop in general, since there's no silver mine on the East Coast, um, you know, a colonial silversmith is really depending on the customer to bring the, co uh, the silver in the form of money or items that are out of fashion. And uh, I've been reading numerous instances of large trading companies giving a silversmith, one, in one instance, 800 Spanish dollars to then turn around and make product for the fur trade. So uh, you know, whether it's European goods or for the native trade, money is being melted down and made into items. And then of course old items, you know, old cups, old jewelry may, you know, melted and made into things as well. But uh, I was very surprised to see how many Spanish coins were being used for trade silver too. Mm -hmm. Uh, which makes sense because there's a lot, you know, uh, circulating in the colonies. And for uh, for iron, uh, we have the opposite. Whereas there's little or no silver found along the coastal region, iron is found in abundance. But that uh, ability to work iron, uh, refine iron uh, from ore, really comes to North America with European contact. Uh, so the earliest iron working in Virginia, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> comes right after first settlement at Jamestown. Um, they land in the spring of 1607, they're making iron by the fall of 1607, 
and there's a blast furnace for commercial produce, production of iron uh, under construction by 1619. By the time we represent here in Williamsburg, the American colonies were the third biggest producer of iron in the world. So the raw material is abundant here. Some of this trade with uh, the native population is done from local workshops um, using that local iron. A great deal of that iron produced in North America is exported back to England, and that gets incorporated into uh, commercial manufactured goods, some of which then come back to North America. So the bulk of those objects that are being traded, though, are products of English industry with a little bit of local production. Of In terms of textiles, um, literally the world, as silk, cotton, wool, and linen um, are all represented in the trade lists, um, there's, there's virtually no place on the, the globe to which you could point from where some of those fibers are not coming. Um, cotton uh, of Indian and Sea Island growth might be of Indian, meaning Eastern Indian as opposed to Native American uh, Indian, uh, manufacture into the, the fabric. But as I commented with the shirt earlier, Manchester in the northwest of England already has a substantial cotton uh, industry, particularly in uh, those printed goods. Um, linens from all over Europe, but certain types of linen tend to be associated with certain areas. The most common linen in trade lists is Osnaburg, which comes originally from Osnabrück in Germany. Um, but the product becomes in such remarkable demand, and not just for the Native American market, but for the, the general um, European market, that um, Osnaburg linens become imitated elsewhere. So there is Scotch Osnaburg and Irish Osnaburg and true German uh, Osnaburg. Something like, uh, like this metal trim has gold that uh, may come from Africa, but then made into uh, a metal thread or a tinsel wrapped thread. Um, a lot of that production is in Italy and France uh, in the 18th century, and then sold through an English merchant to um, an American merchant to a Native American consumer. I think it's really important to realize that Native American communities, Native American individuals are part of this massive global trading system and that they are aware of that in the 18th century. Uh, they have knowledge of from where these products come. And in some cases, it may be those, the distant manufacturer that makes them desirable and fashionable uh, to the Native American user. So the time period that we represent you know, here at Colonial Williamsburg, the third quarter of the 18th century for the most part, this has been going on for a really long time, this sort of trade. Is there a sense among members of different uh, Native American communities of certain things being lost by, by bringing in new items? Are, are there certain skills and, and uh, traditional folkways that are sort of eroded over time as, as these European goods were, were coming in? Yeah, you see examples um, like that of in uh, wampum making where you get glass beads um, being introduced to the trade. And so you see less people, uh, native folks, making these, uh, these wampum beads where they can get glass beads. Uh, it's just much more convenient for them to um, get the glass beads to use in their clothing or uh, necklaces and adornments. I do have some beadwork here on the side of my leggings. These are glass beads as well as woven into my garters. Um, and so when you see those, the introduction of some of these things, people stop making stuff like wampum. Um, it's just a very long, tedious process, and it's much easier to get these glass beads. And you'll see uh, even more colors becoming more common, right? So with the wampum shells and, uh, and making into beads, there are lots of purples and whites, but then once you get these glass beads, you'll see blues and more true whites and uh, green uh, wampum beads and lots of different um, colors as well. Thanks. I think we have time for one last question, and this is, this is such a, a big topic, and I know that 
Chris, you are working to, to start up a new program here in the near future on Indian trade. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about what, what's to come and what folks can expect to find in the future? So uh, I'm currently in the works with a program with um, Kemper, who you saw in some of the other videos um, with myself. And we're working with Coach and Livestock to uh, launch a new program. It's the American Indian Trader Program. And you'll see us walking about the city uh, with various trade goods attached to the horses on uh, saddlebags and in baskets that the horses are carrying for us so that you can see the, that representation of some of the Indian traders that are going to and from these colonies and to and from these different nations. We'll be stopping in front of some of the shops with uh, various items that you can find in these shops, axe heads, um, tomahawks, knives, and things like that. And then we also have um, some silver items, the armbands, the brooches, the pins, um, and we'll stop in front of the silversmith shop and talk about you know, where those things are, are going to in Native societies, and then as well as we'll have some textiles loaded up. So you'll be able to see us in, in, around these various shops so you can see how they're coming and going to these different nations, but as well, we'll be able to direct you inside so that you can really take a look at you know, how some of these things are made. So I encourage you to come talk to us while we're uh, doing the American Indian Trader Program. And I really encourage you to go into some of these shops and see some of the hands-on stuff where they're making a lot of these products. Thank you so much, Chris, and thank you, Mark and Ken and Bobby, all, all, all four of you for sharing your knowledge and passion and skills with us today. This project was funded in part by a generous grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. As always, this program was also made possible through the generosity of our donors. Thank you. To learn how you can contribute, please follow the links pinned to the comments below or visit us at colonialwilliamsburg.org. Uh, Chris, do you have any final thoughts for us today? Um, I just would like to say, you know, it's been a pleasure to talk about some of these things with uh, my compatriots here. And please come check us out at all of our separate programming. Uh, we have programs on the stage for the American Indian Initiative, as well as these shops have such wonderful things going on where you can see um, truly how some of these items are being made, uh, as well as to learn more and, and ask more questions. I'm sure there'll be plenty of more questions. So please come and see us here at Colonial Williamsburg. I'm Vivia Brown. I'm Brandon Lyles. And I'm Stacy Loveland. And we're excited to have you join us for Colonial Williamsburg's CW Kids Ask, where we dive deep into history. Together, we'll explore eight.